Section 30 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 41. Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu, and Foreign Affairs. Part 1. France was reduced to submission. Six years of power had sufficed for Richelieu to obtain the mastery. From that moment he directed his ceaseless energy towards Europe. Quote, he feared the repose of peace, said Ambassador Nani in his letters to Venice, and thinking himself more safe amidst the bustle of arms, he was the originator of so many wars, and of such long-continued and heavy calamities, he caused so much blood and so many tears to flow within and without the kingdom, that there is nothing to be astonished at if many people have represented him as faithless, atrocious in his hatred, and inflexible in his vengeance. But no one, nevertheless, can deny him the gifts that this world is accustomed to attribute to its greatest men and his most determined enemies are forced to confess that he had so many and such great ones that he would have carried with him power and prosperity wherever he might have had the direction of affairs we may say that having brought back unity to divided france having succoured italy upset the empire confounded england and enfeebled spain he was the instrument chosen by divine providence to direct the great events of europe the Venetian's independent and penetrating mind did not mislead him. Everywhere in Europe were marks of Richelieu's handiwork. Quote, there must be no end to negotiations near and far, was his saying. He had found negotiations succeed in France. He extended his views. Numerous treaties had already marked the early years of the cardinal's power, and after 1630 his activity abroad was redoubled. Between 1623 and 1642, seventy-four treaties were concluded by Richelieu, four with England, twelve with the United Provinces, fifteen with the Princes of Germany, six with Sweden, twelve with Savoy, six with the Republic of Venice, three with the Pope, three with the Emperor, two with Spain, four with Lorraine, one with the Grey Leagues of Switzerland, one with Portugal, two with the revolters of Catalonia and Roussillon, one with Russia, two with the Emperor of Morocco. Such was the immense network of diplomatic negotiations whereof the Cardinal held the threads during nineteen years. An enumeration of the alliances would serve, without further comment, to prove this, that the foreign policy of Richelieu was a continuation of that of Henry IV. It was to Protestant alliances that he looked for their support in order to maintain the struggle against the House of Austria, whether the German or the Spanish branch. In order to give his views full swing, he waited till he had conquered the Huguenots at home. Nearly all his treaties with Protestant powers are posterior to 1630. So soon as he was secure that no political discussions in France itself would come to thwart his foreign designs, he marched with a firm step towards that enfeeblement of Spain and that upsetting of the empire of which Nani speaks. Henry the Fourth and Queen Elizabeth, pursuing the same end, had sought and found the same allies. Richelieu had the good fortune, beyond theirs, to meet, for the execution of his designs, with Gustavus Adolphus, King of Sweden. Richelieu had not yet entered the King's Council, in 1624, when the breaking off of the long negotiations between England and Spain, on the subject of the marriage of the Prince of Wales with the Infanta, was officially declared to Parliament. At the very moment when Prince Charles, with the Duke of Buckingham, was going post-haste to Madrid to see the Infanta Marianne of Spain, they were already thinking, at Paris, of marrying him to Henrietta of France, the king's young sister, scarcely fourteen years of age. King James I was at that time obstinately bent upon his plan of alliance with Spain. When it failed, his son and big favourite forced his hand to bring him round to France. His envoys at Paris, the Earl of Carlisle and Lord Holland, found themselves confronted by Cardinal Richelieu, commissioned, together with some of his colleagues, to negotiate the affair. M. Guizot, in his Projet de mariage royal, 1863, Paris, Achette et Compagnie, has said that the marriage of Henry the Fourth's daughter with the Prince of Wales was, in Richelieu's eyes, one of the essential acts of a policy necessary to the greatness of the kingship and of France. He obtained the best conditions possible for the various interests involved, but without any stickling and without favour for such and such a one of these interests, skilfully adapting words and appearance, but determined upon attaining his end. 
The tarryings and miscarriages of Spanish policy had warned Richelieu to make haste. Quote, In less than nine moons, says James I's private secretary, James Howell, this great matter was proposed, prosecuted, and accomplished, whereas the sun might, for as many years, have run his course from one extremity of the zodiac to the other, before the court of Spain would have arrived at any resolution and conclusion. That gives a good idea of the difference between the two nations, the leaden step of the one and the quick silver movements of the other. It also shows that the Frenchman is more noble in his proceedings, less full of scruple, reserve, and distrust, and that he acts more chivalrously. In France, meanwhile, as well as in Spain, the question of religion was the rock of offence. Richelieu confined himself to demanding, in a general way, that in this matter the King of England should grant, in order to obtain the sister of the King of France, all that he had promised in order to obtain the King of Spain's. Quote, so much was required, he said, by the equality of the two crowns. End quote. The English negotiators were much embarrassed. The Protestant feelings of Parliament had shown themselves very strongly on the subject of the Spanish marriage. Quote, as to public freedom for the Catholic religion, says the Cardinal, they would not so much as hear of it, declaring that it was a design, under cover of alliance, to destroy their constitution, even to ask such a thing of them. End quote. Quote, you want to conclude the marriage, said Lord Holland to the Queen Mother, and yet you enter on the same paths that the Spaniards took to break it off, which causes all sorts of doubts and mistrusts, the effect whereof the Premier Minister of Spain, Count Olivares, is very careful to aggravate by saying that, if the Pope granted a dispensation for the marriage with France, the King his master would march to Rome with an army and give it up to sack. End quote. Quote, we will soon stop that answered Mary de Medici quickly, we will cut out work for him elsewhere. End quote. At last it was agreed that King James and his son should sign a private engagement, not inserted in the contract of marriage, quote, securing to the English Catholics more liberty and freedom in all that concerns their religion, end quote, than they would have obtained by virtue of any articles whatsoever accorded by the marriage treaty with Spain, provided that they made sparing use of them, rendering to the King of England the, quote, obedience owed by good and true subjects, the which King of his benevolence would not bind them by any oath contrary to their religion, end quote. The promises were vague, and the securities anything but substantial. Still, the vanity as well as the fears of King James were appeased, and Richelieu had secured, simultaneously with his own ascendancy, the policy of France. Nothing remained but to send to Rome for the purpose of obtaining the dispensation. The ordinary ambassador, Count de Bethune, did not suffice for so delicate a negotiation. Richelieu sent Father Berulle. Father Berulle, founder of the Brotherhood of the Oratory, patron of the Carmelites, and the intimate friend of Francis de Sales, though devoid of personal ambition, had been clever enough to keep himself on good terms with Cardinal Richelieu, whose political views he did not share, and with the court of Rome, whose most faithful allies, the Jesuits, he had often thwarted. He was devoted to Queen Mary de' Medici, and willingly promoted her desires in the matter of her daughter's marriage. He found the court of Rome in confusion, and much exercised by Spanish intrigue. Quote, this court, he wrote to the cardinal, is in conduct and in principles very different from what one would suppose before having tried it for oneself. For my part, I confess to having learned more of it in a few hours since I have been on the spot than I knew by all the talk that I have heard. The dial constantly observed in this country is the balance existing between France, Italy, and Spain. End quote. Quote, the king my master, said Count de Bethune quite openly, has obtained from England all he could. It is of no use to wait for more ample conditions, or to measure them by the Spanish L. I have orders against sending off any courier, save to give notice of concession of the dispensation. Otherwise there would be nothing but asking one thing after another. End quote. Quote, if we determine to act like Spain, we, like her, shall lose everything, said Father Beril. Some weeks later, on the 6th of January, 1625, Berulle wrote to the cardinal, quote, For a month I have been on the point of starting, but we have been obliged to take so much trouble, and have so many meetings on the subject of transcripts and missives, as well as the kernel of the business, I will merely tell you that the dispensation is pure and simple. End quote. King James I had died on the 6th of April, 1625. And so it was King Charles I, and not the Prince of Wales, whom the Duke of Chevreuse represented at Paris on the 11th of May, 1625, at the espousals of Princess Henrietta Maria. 
She set out on the 2nd of June for England, escorted by the Duke of Buckingham, who had been sent by the King to fetch her, and who had gladly prolonged his stay in France, smitten as he was by the young Queen Anne of Austria. Charles I went to Dover to meet his wife, showing himself very amiable and attentive to her. Though she little knew how fatal they would be to her, the King of England's palaces looked bare and deserted to the new Queen, accustomed as she was to French elegance. She, however, appeared contented. Quote, how can your majesty reconcile yourself to a huguenot for a husband asked one of her suite indiscreetly quote, why not she replied with spirit was not my father one End quote. by this speech henrietta maria expressed undoubtedly without realizing all its grandeur the idea which had suggested her marriage and had been prominent in france during the whole negotiations it was the policy of henry the fourth that henry the fourth's daughter was bringing to a triumphant issue the marriage between henrietta maria and charles i negotiated and concluded by cardinal richelieu was the open declaration of the fact that the style of protestant or catholic was not the supreme law of policy in christian europe and that the interests of the nations should not remain subservient to the religious faith of the reigning or governing personages unhappily the policy of henry the fourth carried on by cardinal richelieu found no queen elizabeth any longer on the throne of england to comprehend it and maintain it Charles I tossed about between the haughty caprices of his favourite Buckingham and the religious or political passions of his people, did not long remain attached to the great idea which had predominated in the alliance of the two crowns. Proud and timid, imperious and awkward all at the same time, he did not succeed in the first instance in gaining the affections of his young wife, and early infractions of the treaty of marriage the dismissal of all the queen's french servants hostilities between the merchant navies of the two nations had for some time been paving the way for open war when the duke of buckingham in the hope of winning back to him the house of commons june sixteen twenty six madly attempted the expedition against the island of ray what was the success of it as well as of the two attempts that followed it has already been shown three years later on the twenty fourth of april sixteen twenty nine the king of england concluded peace with france without making any stipulation in favour of the reformers whom hope of aid from him had drawn into rebellion quote, i declare says the duke of rohan that i would have suffered any sort of extremity rather than be false to the many sacred oaths we had given him not to listen to any treaty without him who had many times assured us that he would never make peace without including us in it End quote the english accepted the peace quote, as the king had desired not wanting the king of great britain to meddle with his rebellious huguenot subjects any more than he would want to meddle with his catholic subjects if they were to rebel against him memoire de richelieu page four twenty one the subjects of charles i were soon to rebel against him and france kept her word and did not interfere the hollanders with more prudence and ability than distinguished buckingham and charles i had done better service to the protestant cause without ever becoming entangled in the quarrels that divided france natural enemies as they were of spain and the house of austria they readily seconded richelieu in the struggle he maintained against them besides the united provinces were as yet poor and the cardinal always managed to find money for his allies nearly all the treaties he concluded with holland were treaties of alliance and subsidy those of sixteen forty one and sixteen forty two secured to them twelve hundred thousand livres a year out of the coffers of france once only the hollanders were faithless to their engagements it was during the siege of rochelle when the national feeling would not admit of war being made on the french huguenots all the forces of protestantism readily united against spain richelieu had but to direct them she in fact was the great enemy and her humiliation was always the ultimate aim of the cardinal's foreign policy the struggle power to power between france and spain explains during that period nearly all the political and military complications in europe there was no lack of pretexts for bringing it on the first was the question of the valteline a lovely and fertile valley which extending from the lake of como to the tyrol thus serves as a natural communication between italy and germany possessed but lately as it was by the grey leagues of the protestant swiss the valteline a catholic district had revolted at the instigation of spain in sixteen twenty the emperor savoy and spain had wanted to divide the spoil between them when france the old ally of the grissons had interfered and in sixteen twenty three the forts of the valteline had been entrusted on deposit to the pope urban the eighth 
He still retained them in 1624, when the Grisson lords, seconded by a French reinforcement under the orders of the Marquis of Coeuvre, attacked the feeble garrison of the Valteline. In a few days they were masters of all the places in the canton. The Pope sent his nephew, Cardinal Barberini, to Paris to complain of French aggression, and with a proposal to take the sovereignty of the Valteline from the Grisson. That was, to give it to Spain. Quote, Besides, said Cardinal Richelieu, the precedent and consequences of it would be perilous for kings in whose dominions it hath pleased God to permit diversity of religion. End quote. The legate could obtain nothing. The assembly of notables, convoked by Richelieu in 1625, approved of the king's conduct, and war was resolved upon. The siege of La Rochelle retarded it for two years. Richelieu wanted to have his hands free. He concluded a specious peace with Spain, and the Valteline remained for the time being in the hands of the Grissons, who were one day themselves to drive the French out of it. Whilst the cardinal was holding La Rochelle besieged, the Duke of Mantua had died in Italy, and his natural heir, Charles de Gonzaga, who was settled in France with the title of Duke of Nevers, had hastened to put himself in possession of his dominions. Meanwhile, the Duke of Savoy claimed the Marquisate of Montferrat. The Spaniards supported him. They entered the dominions of the Duke of Mantua and laid siege to Casal. When La Rochelle succumbed, Casal was still holding out. But the Duke of Savoy had already made himself master of the greater part of Montferrat. The Duke of Mantua claimed the assistance of the King of France, whose subject he was. Here was a fresh battlefield against Spain, and scarcely had he been victorious over the Rochelais when the king was on the march for Italy. The Duke of Savoy refused a passage to the royal army, which found the defile of Sousa Pass fortified with three barricades. Marshal Bassompierre went to the king, who was a hundred paces behind the storming party, ahead of his regiment of guards. Quote, Sir, said he, the company is ready, the violins have come in, and the masks are at the door. When your majesty pleases, we will commence the ballet. The king came up to me and said to me angrily, Do you know, pray, that we have but five hundred pounds of lead in the park of artillery? I said to him, It is a pretty time to think of that. Must the ballet not dance for lack of one mask that is not ready? Leave it to us, sir, and all will go well. Do you answer for it? said he to me. Sir, replied the cardinal, by the marshal's looks I prophesy that all will be well. Rest assured of it. End quote. Memoire de Bassompierre. The French dashed forward, the marshals with the storming party, and the barricades were soon carried. The Duke of Savoy and his son had hardly time to fly. Quote, gentlemen, cried the Duke to some Frenchmen who happened to be in his service, gentlemen, allow me to pass. Your countrymen are in a temper. End quote. With the same dash, on debouching from the mountains, the king's troops entered Susa. The Prince of Piedmont soon arrived to ask for peace. He gave up all pretensions to Montferrat, and promised to negotiate with the Spanish general to get the siege of Casal raised, and the effect was that, on the 18th of March, Casal, delivered, quote, by the mere wind of the renown gained by the king's arms, saw, with tears of joy, the Spaniards retiring desolate, showing no longer that pride which they had been wont to wear on their faces, looking constantly behind them, not so much from regret for what they were leaving, as for fear lest the king's vengeful sword should follow after them, and come to strike their death-blow. Memoire de Richelieu, page 370. The Spaniards remained, however, in Milanes, ready to burst again upon the Duke of Mantua. The king was in a hurry to return to France in order to finish the subjugation of the reformers in the south, commanded by the Duke of Rohan. The cardinal placed little or no reliance upon the Duke of Savoy, whose, quote, mind could get no rest, and going more swiftly than the rapid movements of the heavens, made every day more than twice the circuit of the world, thinking how to set by the ears all kings, princes, and potentates, one with another, so that he alone might reap advantage from their divisions, end quote. Memoire de Richelieu, page 375. A league, however, was formed between France, the Republic of Venice, the Duke of Mantua, and the Duke of Savoy, for the defence of Italy in case of fresh aggression on the part of the Spaniards, and the king, who had just concluded peace with England, took the road back to France. Scarcely had the cardinal joined him before Privas when an imperialist army advanced into the Grisson, and supported by the celebrated Spanish general Spinola, laid siege to Mantua. Richelieu did not hesitate. He entered Piedmont in the month of March, 1630, to march before long on Pignerol, an important place commanding the passage of the Alps. It, as well as the citadel, was carried in a few days. 
the governor having asked for time to quote, do his Easter, end quote, or take the sacrament. Marshal Criqui, who was afraid of seeing aid arrive from the Duke of Savoy, had all the clocks in the town put on, to such purpose that the governor had departed, and the place was in the hands of the French when the reinforcements came up. The Duke of Savoy was furious, and had the soldiers who surrendered Pignerol cut in pieces. End of section 30